Okay, once again, good day. Um, right away, I, I, I forgot to do something. Um, I want to introduce the recorder, Dan, um, who's doing the, this online recording. And there he is. Uh, Dan uh, took this course as an undergraduate. So as I present this, I'm carefully watching his face to get his uh, reactions and so that I can adjust as I go along. I didn't put too much pressure on you. Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> but, but if you want to ask me the occasional question. And he said if I want to ask him an occasional question, I, I, right. I can do that. Um, I won't put any more pressure on him than already exists. If I answer it uh, incorrectly, I'm going to cut it up. Though. OK. Um, let me begin um, with a biography of Marx. You should know something about who the man was. Um, and I also have another motivation for presenting this little uh, uh, story about Marx. Um, I'm going to also introduce the dialectic um, as I tell you the story of Marx. So I'm going to tell you very briefly, just take me a few moments, this uh, story of, of Marx, the man, and the way he th thinks, this Marxian theory. But in so doing, once again, I'm going to also present to you uh, the methodology of Marx, that is this concept of overdetermination. So there's two th purposes here. First, Marx is uh, what Marx was born in Germany in 1818, beginning of the 19th century, and he dies at the end of the 19th century, 1883. So the first thing uh, we can say about this is that Marx, in the way he thought about society, that, you know, the development of his Marxian theory, was a complex product of the economic changes that were occurring um, in Germany and France and in England and so forth over these decades. Just like everybody else, we are all, including Marx, a complex product, a complex effect of the economic times. And just to explore that for a moment, um, during this period of time in Germany, dramatic changes were occurring, which was the death of an old society, feudalism, and the birth of a new society, capitalism. That's always interesting, birth and death. So Marx becomes intrigued with the following question. How does capitalism, that's the birth of capitalism, arise in society? And he's going to argue that the birth of capitalism arises in and out of the death of feudalism. And it's called, within the Marxian tradition, the transition from feudalism to capitalism, and it forms the end of volume one that I asked you to read in this course. So there you can read Marx's ideas about how one society moves from, a, from an, to another. Uh, bear that in mind, because Marx, and especially the Marxists after him, are going to also be concerned with an, a different kind of transition, which is the movement, the transition from capitalism to socialism and communism. So there is a lot at stake in this kind of theoretical analysis that Marx is going to present in terms of the movement of one kind of society uh, to another. So one of the things that Marx then does, he begins to theorize the movement of one society from another because that was occurring uh, during his day and people were asking, what's the birth of this capitalism, how did it come about, and so forth. Next. There's no question, as you all know, that this is a period of time in Europe in which there's enormous industrialization occurring as part of this growth and development of capitalism, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution, roughly, in England from 1750 to 1850, and then another one from 1850 to World War I, uh, the revolution in, in textiles and consumer goods in the first 100 years, and then the revolution in all kinds of uh, capital goods and heavy industry in the second from 1850 roughly to, to World War I. That's occurring in, in Germany and Western Europe as well. It's a little bit later than what occurred in England, but nonetheless, tremendous industrialization. So Marx answers or tries to come up with an answer to the questions of the day. What, what's producing all this industrialization? What is the nature of it? Third, Marx's, the title of his book is called Capital. Well, that's an interesting question. People want to know in this development of capitalism and this tremendous growth of industry, what is capital? 
So Marx begins to theorize, provide an answer to the economic questions of the day, not only the transition from feudalism to capitalism, not only what's causing industrialization, but what is capital? And of course, you can see the next question, of what is a capitalist? So Marx is going to provide new answers to this question, as well as things like the following. Um, what produces the value of something? How do we explain price of both inputs and outputs? So Marx is going to provide in volume one of, of Capital, again, that which we're reading here, an explanation for the price of something. Okay, and, and let me pick up, since it connects to what we've already done, and we may as well make use of it. What Marx is going to try and show is that the price of something, uh, I left it on the blackboard, the price of something in the market is connected to class exploitation. This is going to be a very famous and important part of his theory. What he's going to show is, again, that the price of, of, an, of an apple, the price of a car in the market, contains within it class exploitation. That's consistent with what we did before. Finally, since it's appropriate today, Marx is going to provide a theorization of the ups and downs of capitalism, the incessant business cycle <coughs> that capitalism suffers from. So the booms followed by the busts followed by the booms. Marx is going to provide, and we're going to do that in exquisite detail in this course, a theorization, an explanation of the business cycle. So to summarize. Marx and his thinking is a complex product of the economic changes of the day, but, but that's not a, all of it, right? That's only a small portion of it. Marx and his thinking are obviously, like all of us, a complex product of a variety of other things. For example, Marx is a product, he's complexly shaped by the influences of his mother and father. Marx carried with him, if I remember correctly, a picture of his father next to his heart for the rest of his life and was buried with that picture. So, you know, did his father have an influence upon him? I mean, I just think of what I just told you. Of course he did. Just like your father and my father had an influence on each of us and our mothers and our grandmothers and grandfathers and brothers and sisters. So this, this, this personal impact that our families have upon us and the way we think. Also, his education. Marx studied at the University of Bonn for one year, then he went to the University of Berlin, a very famous university um, in, in, in Germany, and studied there. Um, he studied there, by the way, at Berlin, and he made this, this transfer uh, from Bonn to Berlin at the urging of his father. His father th thought that Berlin was a more serious place uh, for Marx, so he went there at the urging of his father. Uh, and he studied there um, the, the curriculum of the day, uh, you know, law and, and uh, politics and so forth, philosophy. He got his PhD there in, in his uh, 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 dissertation his, for his PhD. He studied Greek philosophy. Um, and one of the things that Marx worked on in his dissertation, and one of the things that Greeks were interested in, and we're going to come back to it in this course, is the notion of causation. Uh, there were two, if I may summarize this, there were two uh, ideas of causation that many of the Greeks uh, struggled with. One was a cause and effect idea in which A causes B causes C and so forth. The other was uh, very different. The other was held by uh, people who were skeptical that you could kind of order life into A causes B and causes C. They were called skeptics. Um, and they argued something quite different. They argued that every cause was an effect, and every effect was a cause. People like Epicurus and Zeno, uh, they were skeptical of that you could order the world. Uh, they didn't think that the entities that were being ordered were independent of one another, and hence you couldn't, cause, you couldn't order them in such a way because they, they were not independent, such that A would cause B, B would cause C, and so forth. In any case, Marx's notion of dialectics was influenced by his study of these Greek philosophers. Okay, so did his studies affect him the way he thought? And so, of course they did, just like you and me. Marx marries um, a young woman, Jenny, Jenny von Westphalen, if I remember correctly, their last name. Did his marriage affect him? I mean, that's a silly, a silly question. Of course it did. 
Marx had a friendship with a number of people, the most important uh, with whom was Engels. So as you all know, Marx and Engels, Engels um, had a profound influence on, on Marx, as Marx did on, 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 on Engels. Uh, Marx, Engels was a, uh, a man of fairly uh, wealthy means, who owned some factories um, in England, and he helped to support Marx uh, for much of Marx's life. Besides their intellectual relationship with other and their political relationship with one another, they were comrades. Uh, but Engels also wrote checks to help support Marx. Marx suffered from poverty uh, over much of his life. And the question, did poverty affect him? Of course it did. Uh, so his friendship with Engels, his marriage, the economic events of the day, his studies, those all helped to shape the way he thought. Marx was also um, a student of uh, French socialist writings. Um, he was both uh, enamored with and criticized uh, the French socialists. The French socialists were unhappy with the capitalism of the day. Um, so Marx w was attracted to these individuals who were unhappy with, with the capitalism of the day as it was growing up, uh, especially in France. Um, but Marx differed from them as well and provided a criticism of them, it, it, once again, to pick up what we did before. And the reason is because the French socialists, according to Marx and, and according to Engels, did not have a class criticism of society. They criticized society the poverty of the day and so forth, the business cycle, but they did not connect their criticism um, to surplus value. And so that Marx is going to provide a critique of them for that reason. He also studies British political economy that was growing in the day. He studies Adam Smith. He studies uh, David Ricardo and, and, and still others. So he begins to study economics, not just Greek philosophy, not just the French so socialists, not just history, but also economics. And in part, he's going to come up with an economic theory that is different from uh, Smith and, and Ricardo, but he's always very respectful of those mighty thinkers. Um, it, it just goes on and on. Let me just give you one more. Marx was a political refugee. That is, even as a young man, um, he became, became uh, noted to the authorities as a person who was a, a problem, a problem in Germany, a problem in France, a problem in Belgium. And so he was moving from one society to another, one country from another. As he came under increasing pressure of the uh, police, uh, the political authorities of the day, because his ideas were troublesome, as I told you, they were produced an element of, of fear amongst the people. Don't forget that Marx and Engels were the two uh, individuals who produced something in the 1840s called a communist manifesto. They were asked by a league of uh, workers in France to produce a manifesto for them. And Marx and Engels responded by saying, OK, here is a blueprint for you workers. Um, and that blueprint uh, for the workers was very, very important in the revolt of the workers across uh, Eastern and Western Europe um, in the 1840s. Okay, so Marx was a problem. Okay, and that aspect of his being a problem and his being a political refugee he ends up in England um, affected him just like um, anyone being a political refugee has his her ideas and uh, his her experiences uh, colored in part by that uh, uh, experience. Let me summarize this then okay? because there's a theory here. So what I'm going to do now, I told you a little bit about the story of Marx but I want to now use it to kind of get across if I can this notion of uh, the dialectic or overdetermination. So let me erase this from the whiteboard and summarize what we just did, if I may. So um, what I'm after here is Marx and the way he thinks his theory. Well, the first thing I talked about, Marx and the way he thinks, the way he thinks about society, that his class theory of society was caused by the economic events. That had a shaping influence on Marx. But also, this last one I talked about, and also politics. He was a refugee. That shaped the way he understood society. But also, culture. That is, 
I just told you, Marx studied the Greek philosophers, he studied British political economy, French socialists, and so much more. So all those different ideas, the, the economics of Smith and Ricardo, the, the, the struggle of the, the, uh, uh, the struggle of the ancient philosophers with the notions of causation, the socialists of the time, all shaped Marx's ideas. And of course, besides economics and political and cultural events, he was also shaped by nature. I mean, you can't leave that out. Okay, you know, how much hair he had, his height, um, his frame, um, his, you know, his brain also was a function of biology and chemistry, I mean, like, like the rest of us. These are different kinds of causations, different kinds of determinations. So po political events help to determine him, shape him, economic help to shape him, and the result of all of this, if I keep on doing this, is of course Marx. So, the dot exists as a site of causations, of determinations emanating from real, literally everything in society, political, economic, culture, and of course, nature too. So, we can say that Marx and the way he thought is, now I'm going to use the word, overdetermined by literally an infinity of different political, economic, and cultural events that are occurring. Okay. The word overdetermination, the, the, the prefix on it, over, is kind of a, this is what I, 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 I'm guessing, is kind of a poetic way of getting across to individuals that the existence of anything, in this case the man and the way he thinks, or you and me, the existence of anything is complexly shaped by so much, and that over is a way of trying to capture the idea that there's so much outside of us that shapes us, overdetermined. Okay, so first idea. I'm going to repeat this now. Okay, overdetermination means that any particular entity, no matter what it is, okay, and I'm using the example here of the person and the way he thinks, the way he sees, he can keep bad this, his behavior, is complexly shaped by all these other events, all these other, I'm going to call them processes, political, economic, cultural, and natural. Step one. Step two. The way a person thinks and the way a person acts also shapes everything that is shaping that person. So Marxian theory, Marx and his theory, complexly shape, you know, the economy and politics and culture and nature and it, it looks messy and it should be getting messy. But what we're arguing here is that a person and the way he she thinks and the way he she sees is not only shaped by society but also is a partial shaping of the society which is shaping that person. And that's getting, that's getting closer to this notion of, of the dialectic. Is that everything is both a cause and effect. Marx in his thinking is an effect of everything, but it's also a cause of that which is effecting, shaping Marx in his thinking. So nothing in the world, according to this theory, is only a cause or only effect. Everything is both cause and effect. And that's, that's the lesson of this, this uh, uh, dialectic. Why this is going to be uh, very important in terms of the next thing that we're going to to talk about is that when we discuss epistemology, this theory of, of knowledge that, that I uh, uh, mentioned to you in the introductory uh, lectures, there we're going to discuss the connection between two kinds of entities. The way a person thinks and all the political, economic, cultural, and of course natural experiences that the person um, has. 
And in terms of what we just did, if we deploy this notion of, of overdetermination, we're going to argue there that the way a person thinks complexly shapes his or her experiences, and his or her experiences complexly shape the way a person thinks. Sounds logical. Rationalism and empiricism, the two great tra tra uh, uh, epistemologies, traditional epistemologies, I should say, have a very different notion of causation. Empiricists are going to claim that our experiences shape the way we think, but there's no feedback from thinking to our experiences. So in the last instance, experiences will be the foundation for truth. Rationalists are going to argue something very, very different from that. They're going to differ with the empiricists. They're going to argue that reason shapes our experiences. They're going to argue that reason is the foundation of truth. Notice something, that rationalism and empiricism come up with, albeit two different standards of truth. Empiricism, experience, rationalism, reason or logic, but they have in common that they're both offering two ways to get truth, two ways to kind of validate what is true and what is not true. Marx is presenting a critique of them and an alternative which is saying there's no way to do that. Why? Because the two standards that have been presented, experience on one part, or empiricism, rationalism on the other part, uh, I'm sorry, reason uh, by the rationalists on the other hand, they have they're not standards. They're not what, because they're not independent of one another. That is, thought and experience complexly shape one another, overdetermine one another, which is consistent with this kind of logic. So that on the next lecture, I'm going to begin to present that idea and why it's an important idea.